Hi, today I'd like to talk about one of my favorite model Rickenbackers, the Model 425. A lot of people don't give this model a ton of props because uh, they call it a student guitar, a budget guitar with its single pickup. Um, I find them very charming. Uh, the very first Rickenbacker I ever played was a Model 425, so the first time I experienced that unique uh, Rickenbacker, almost kind of you know, glass-like finish feel in my hands was, was a 425, and, and I guess you could say it imprinted on me because I've always had a, a special place for them. Um, I also, uh, George Harrison did too, at least for maybe 20 minutes. Uh, he wanted to be like John maybe, and uh, picked one up on a, uh, a pre Beatlemania trip visiting his sister in St. Louis. Uh, he, he found a, a fire glow uh, one, like the one in the center here, which he then had painted black and uh, used it for a few months. Uh, most notably, it's uh, reputed to be the guitar that plays on I Want to Hold Your Hand. Um, because not a lot of people pay attention to this guitar, I think even fewer people pay attention to the nuances uh, that exist between the different ears, and I thought uh, having three of them gathered here uh, would be fun to maybe do just that. Uh, from left to right, uh, that is a 1960, the center one is a 1963, and the one on the right is a 1966. Um, Rickenbacker usually named uh, guitars, uh, you know, with three digits, and then they had uh, the last number being a five denoted a vibrato, which we have here, not here. For some reason, the 425 was named the 425, even though it didn't have a vibrato, um, at least not originally. Um, there's some literature from the 62-63 period that shows um, what's called a Boyd vibrato. It's, it was made by a, a Southern California company. It kind of had look, looks like a long paper clip kind of handle. Uh, I've seen them in literature, but I've never seen a picture of an actual one. Uh, it didn't really show up in earnest until 66 um, or 65 when they, uh, the Boyd company started importing these Tiasco units. So they weren't actually made by Boyd. They were a Japanese part that Boyd imported and uh, they made this version of the 425. When this came out, 65, 66, this became the 420. But up until that time, this was called the 425. So there's a lot of confusion over what it's actually called, but that's, that's really the story, as near as I can figure. Uh, the first iteration of this guitar came out in, uh, well, there's one supposedly made in 1959, uh, but it began in earnest in 1960. Um, this is one of the first ones. Uh, on the Rick Resource site, this is the second oldest uh, serial number one. Um, they made about a thousand of these according to the serial number uh, from, six, I guess, technically 59 through uh, 61. Um, and they're pretty unique for having these very thick bodies compared to the thin, thin ones. Um, it had some early features like this disc, which is meant to hook in a saxophone strap. Uh, by the end of the run, um, this disc went away, and actually it already had strap buttons installed. Those were, were factory put on. The finish on this guitar is, um, they were making, originally on the Capris, this was called brown, and then it kind of morphed into fire glow, but when this came out, there was a distinctive fire glow and this, so I don't know, we call this early autumn glow. Um, this guitar is all original except for the pickguard. I replaced it with a Winfield part. Uh, I think it makes the guitar look a lot better. Um, I still have the original, which is right here. It was a very thin white plastic, not like the new ones. And uh, it, it didn't really do the job. The jack was here and you can see how it just pulled right out. Even on the best of times, like when you took the jack out, the whole top would kind of move. So, I mean, if anyone wanted to be original, it'd be easy to screw back in, but I think the gold is a big improvement. Um, came with a single toaster pickup. And uh, this version has a Capri-type bridge, the, the, the four post uh, with individual saddles. Later in this guitar's run, they replaced the saddles with a single strip of Bakelite. When this guitar came out, they changed the bridge design to like a metal saddle and bridge. It's, it's basically a metal bridge with a separate saddle that can be raised or lowered with these two screws. And then it goes into this kind of loom, which is actually the same as what's under here. Um, other differences are, these funky kind of metal name plates. Uh, they look really cool and industrial, but they're actually super fragile. It's not much more than stamped aluminum foil. Um, they bend really easy, and then the finish flakes off, so a lot of them look like this one does. Um, 
Tuners are old uh, Grover Statites. Later they became Clusons. Sometimes you see metal button Clusons, uh, but most of them had these plastic ones. George's first guitar had the plastic ones, but he actually swapped them out later at some point for these earlier Statites. Um, yeah, that's the, that's the early 60. Moving on, um, like I said, the first guitar I played was a 425. It looked a lot like this one. Um, and when I went hunting for, for one for, to, to have, the first one I found was this one. I didn't really want the Void Vibrato. Like it, it was, you know, kind of cool, but I, I kind of more wanted this one, but that's the one I found and could afford. Um, and uh, I don't know, this one's got some cool vibes. It's a, a very unusual one, you know, because it's flamed maple. Um, most of these, especially being at an entry price point, would not have seen wood like this. So it's a little bit of an anomaly. When I finally found a, a you know, proper 63 uh, with, without the void, I bought it thinking I would probably sell this one. But then when I got them together, they were so different that, that I couldn't bring myself to part with, part with it. What are some of those differences? There's actually quite a few of them. Um, starting at the top, the headstock on this one is actually quite a bit bigger. On the 66, it gets more narrow. Um, I feel like the body contour is a little more squared off on this one, a little more rounded off on this one. Um, the, uh, um, the bridges are, well, hard to compare exactly, but um, on, on this one, if it had been a 420 without the vibrato, the bridge would have looked like, bring my little fourth guy here, My 66 Rider ES16 looks like this. See how the, it's the same loom underneath the bridge, but it's mounted further down compared to this one. Rickenbacker actually made a few V63s back in the year 2000. They, I think they made about 100 of them. And they're pretty faithful, except they, uh, they actually use this later style configuration where the bridge is pulled down more. Other subtle differences, the 63 has a metal switch and the knobs are perfectly kind of par par parallel to the bridge. On this later one, um, it's got a plastic tip and the, um, the knobs are kind of a little bit more offset, kind of more perpendicular to the ground when you're, you know, when you're wearing it. Um, these, these 425s, the first ones, are a little tricky to date because the serial number is only four digits. There's no date code. Uh, the, the, the first two letters are missing. And it was put on the bottom, I don't know if you can see it, on the bottom of this little plate, kind of under there. Um, a lot of times that plate's missing, as is the vibrato arm. This is actually not the original vibrato arm. Um, I have the original. It's this little curved guy but it was broken off. So I had to redrill it and re-tap re it and fix it. And this is a Tiasco arm, but it's straight, not curved, but otherwise very similar. Uh, what else? The finishes. Um, 63 has a really distinctive fire glow to me. Most 63 Rickenbackers I've seen have this sort of tomato soup kind of, kind of really soft, really beautiful red. Uh, that's a very 63 thing. I don't have a 64 to show you, but they kind of turned more purple, um, a little more maroon. And then by 65, 67, they were more of this yellow center. A little different. I guess it looks kind of similar, but they, they're a little more bright red, yellow center sometimes. Um, and this one's kind of like that too. This one's also a 66. Um, the tuners are the same. Uh, while we have the back of the guitar, another difference with the 63 is it has a square heel, whereas on the 66 it has a round heel. And uh, yeah, I guess those are the main differences. They, they sound similar, obviously, but I don't know. I feel like this one has a little bit more authority. The 63, it's a little more solid feeling. This one is a little more wiry, a little more jangly maybe. Um, could also be the strings. I tend to keep this one strung up with rounds and this one strung up with flats. Um, but they're, they're all great guitars, and, uh, and the little Ryder too. Um, I got the Ryder from the original family um, that, that had purchased it a few miles from my house, actually. Um, and what they told me was they bought three of them as a package deal, and they came with lessons, and that the teacher played a Rickenbacker. Um, Rickenbacker marketed the 425 as both um, Rickenbackers and Electro, which I understand was to sell to stores like Macy's or whatever, catalog, catalog stores that didn't carry the full line. 
So they didn't compete with their dealers. They gave them a different brand name, which was Electro. But then Ryder is more associated with education. And the way that they explained it was that, um, yeah, the, the store had these riders and they came with lessons and a plan and the teacher had a Rickenbacker. So maybe the idea was to teach students on these and then, uh, and then work their way up to, to um, you know, having a Rickenbacker one day. Uh, but it's a charming little guitar. It's got a lot of the same vibe as the other two. Um, yeah, I dig it. So I think between the four of these guys, my, my 425 itch is, is definitely scratched. Uh, hope, hope you enjoyed this video and, uh, and that it was fun maybe learning something about this, this seldom encountered guitar.